Yeah, we're recording. So how you doing? How's quarantine life with a new baby? Good. I mean, it's getting used to. It's just, it's the work at home plus like homeschooling a 10 month, well, almost a year old. I keep wanting to say 10 months, but she's about to be a year on Monday. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a balance. It's definitely an adjustment. No kidding. It's, um, it's been weird. My, my youngest child turns five on May 4th. Uh-huh. So we're trying to plan a birthday drive by with all the aunts and uncles and everything. Yeah. So you have a May 4th. I'm a, we're, she's a May 4th too. No kidding. Little Jedi baby. <laughs> yeah. It's the only way that I remember her birthday is go, uh, May the 4th. <laughs> she was born in May 4th. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hi, Coach Colin. Hello. You are logged in as Elizabeth Colin, so tell your wife we said hello. <laughs> and I had to uh, commandeer her account because I had uh, 53 people on the meeting yesterday. Oh, wow. Oh. Nice work. So I do this pleasantries. I assume you two know each other. No. You've never met Coach no. Colin? No. All right. So I have hovered around uh, Christine for a while. While I've not actually met her, I know a lot of people that know her, but I've never actually met her. All right, so it's my honor. Man, yeah, same here. We'll we'll do the quick breakdown and fill in the blanks that I'm missing. Um, you are on the national board for diversity and inclusion for U.S. Lacrosse. Yes. You are a coaches development program trainer. Yes. You are a founder slash. I don't know how to describe it, but everything Detroit lacrosse, whether it's the P- the PAL, 8 Mile Lacrosse, uh, Cast Tech, you, you've been instrumental in getting grants and programs and mentorship. Yeah. Um, and you're a new mom with a baby that's going to be one next week. Yes. What um, other details did I leave out? What other roles besides wife, mother, you know, all that other stuff? Um, also on the National U.S. Lacrosse Board of Directors. Um, also a Sankofa clinician. Um, so, and then of course, Michigan chapter as well. Of course. So you've been there, done that, still have the t-shirt for all of it. Um, (laughs) let's go back to the very beginning because part of why we're doing this is we just want to talk to people about lacrosse in Michigan. Um, and I don't know if you've had a chance to watch any of these, but we're talking to people from NCAA D1. We had Hannah Nielsen on, on Tuesday up to, you know, Pat Witt, who founded the Ovid LC boys and girls teams in rural Michigan. So we're not playing favorites. We're talking to everybody. And I think you probably have more stories and have been more involved than most. So oh, wow. where did it start? How did you get involved in the lacrosse? Wow. Um, yeah, that's a, um, so yeah, I started playing in sixth grade. Um, so I went to University of Liggett School. Um, you know, it was one of the original, uh, I would say, uh, I don't want to say like, yeah, original set of schools that are playing lacrosse, you know, yep. healthy, a lot of non-traditional sports. Um, and I fell in love with the game. I mean, it started in gym class. Uh, I had an old Irish uh, coach and um, pretty much learned everything I know from her, uh, you know, and she's, you know, Rowley Stackpool. And so she you know, was officiating and she's still, you know, sometimes officiates here and there. Um, but, you know, goes back with like Pat Hayes and, you know, all those great officials and coaches from, I would say back in the day, but it, it feels like an eternity, but it's only, you know, it's, it's been a while, but not that long, I don't think. Um, and yeah, and so I played through middle school, high school, um, went, played two years club at Xavier University in Cincinnati. Um, so like in picking colleges, I, you know, I wanted to study marketing, but then also I wanted to play lacrosse. So I picked a university, it was between that and Loyola in Maryland, but you know, I like the culture at Xavier. So it wasn't like a D1 um, varsity team, but I was happy to play club. Uh, and then after graduating, um, was able to start coaching at Gross Point North, um, you know, pretty much within a year of graduation and been coaching ever since. Um, so coached there for 10 seasons. Um, nine of that was uh, JV coaching. And then the, my last season there was varsity coaching. Wow. And, you know, just had a passion to, you know, bring the sport to the city of Detroit. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of the city, um, minus when I went away for college. And just wanted to, you know, uh, just share my passion and love of the sport uh, with the kids here. And, and initially I started partnering with Detroit Pal. Um, at back then it was Think Detroit Pal. And, uh, you know, formed some great relationships with this team and staffs over there. And, you know, Detroit's been through some ups and downs with recessions and, you know, everything else that's happening. 
Uh, and so it just wasn't the right time for lacrosse to actually, you know, take, you know, get a good foothold. But we still did clinics. We uh, participated in uh, Metro Detroit Youth Day. Um, and then we, you know, participated in Neighborhoods Day. So we always did something at least every summer um, just to at least keep the momentum going. And then, you know, stars started to align in the past couple years and was able to officially get uh, Detroit City Lacrosse up off the ground. And then also, and then around the same time, uh, shortly after Detroit United Lacrosse formed. And so it was just made sense for us to come together as one versus having, you know, separate programs that were doing similar things, um, you know, slightly different angles, slightly different focus areas. Um, but, you know, to unite forces and have one program. So working with some of Aldred and Leanne McElroy, Ophelia Epps, you know, we all came together and realized, you know, we're more um, powerful as one unit in the city and, and to actually be Detroit United versus having a United team and a whole other team. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then that just led into coaching at Cast Tech. Unfortunately, we weren't able to, you know, get started this year from the girls program. Um, but definitely looking forward to working with the girls over the summer. So um, I'm going to introduce John Losey in one second, but we're going to have summer on this Sunday. We actually had her on a couple weeks ago, and when I tried to convert the file, my, my computer crashed as we were finishing up the call, corrupted the file. So we have all these great stories that we're going to have to pretend we okay. didn't hear her tell us the first time, and, you know, Actic was shocked. Right. Um, but John Losey, Christian Sims, um, she is – been there, done that. She's on the national board for U.S. Lacrosse. She's on the board here for U.S. Lacrosse Michigan. She's a coach's development program trainer. She is involved with Detroit United Lacrosse. She's the one that recruited Summer, I think, or Summer recruited herself to your services. We came together. Perfect. <laughs> so John is our good buddy. John does all the scheduling for Brother Rice's teams. John also does broadcasting whenever Chris colin has got a game on ESPN or Culver's playing Hill in the area. So he's just one of our buddies that we were just kind of talking about. We should do a podcast. And now he's been on every one of these and, and really kind of driving some of these conversations. So um, as far as, you know, we know where you started at Liggett and then Xavier and, and now with, with everything else. Um, what is you kind of, what have you kind of seen as, as the next step for – the, the U.S. chapter here. Um, you and I have had a conversation offline about, you know, we'd really like to get everyone in a room right. with some shareholders and have a strategic planning session and go over the whole SWOT analysis and, and do it all. Mm -hmm. It might be a Zoom call this summer. We don't know. Right. Um, but, but as we've kind of, you, you've seen what's going on in Baltimore with them reducing chapters and you've seen what Baltimore is doing, pushing out the regions and what, you know, we're working really close with Bryce on a lot of the stuff now. Give me your two cents of, Chris, this is what we really got to do in the next 12 months or, or, you know, give me some tough love or, or give us some ideas for where you see it going. Oh, great idea. I mean, um, I would say I'm more of the representative of like the non, uh, you know, hotbed areas of lacrosse in the country. So it's always interesting seeing, you know, some very strong opinions from the East Coast folks and, um, you know, hearing their uh, challenges that they're having. And I think we have opportunity just because we're still an emerging area. Um, yes, we, I would say we've grown exponentially over the past, you know, 20 years or so um, from when I first started playing to where we are now. But I think it's still in infancy in, uh, in terms of how we can continue to emerge as a chapter um, and as a state and getting ourselves organized. Because there's still some, you know, just joint, um, you know, it's still some separation that, you know, men's and women's uh, coaches, you know, we're still kind of on separate sides. Um, you know, we have clubs that are, you know, out here, then we have high school teams, we have youth teams. Um, and so I think there's just a great opportunity to just bring everyone together and have the chapter really be that unifying force. Uh, when it comes to U.S. lacrosse's role, um, you know, it, it, I think us as a chapter, we're a good model for what, how it, things could have run. Uh, and we have time, opportunities to still grow what yeah. that could have been. Uh, even with this changing uh, direct service model that U.S. Lacrosse has gone towards. Um, it's just because it hasn't, the chapter model didn't work in other areas as well, I think, as it, you know, was starting to work here. And I think if we continue to just push that momentum of growing a membership base, um, you know, sh showcasing what the um, uh, member benefits are. And this is something I've also shared with U.S. Lacrosse that, you know, I don't remember what my mem member benefits are until my renewal rolls around and I'm like, yeah. oh, I might get 20% off of something random or when convention rolls around. Yeah. So, you know, it's definitely something that I think in coming from a membership model background, because I used to work at a chamber of commerce and et cetera, you know, running a, and now currently 
even working with alumni for the organization I'm currently with, you know, having a membership model is tough. It is. And it, it requires a lot of engagement, a lot of, you know, uh, touching the audience and working with them and getting feedback and, you know, continuously uh, offering relevant resources and information. And, and it just, it's, it's a time consuming, yeah. <laughs> especially right. being volunteer based. So. So one of the things that we've done, I think we've had a really positive impact with what we've been doing with these conversations over the last six weeks, is we've uncovered a lot of people that didn't know that another person might have had a similar situation, similar want, similar need. Um, I have brought Pat Witt up so many times on this because, you know, my old buddies in the game, like Mike Van Antwerp, who's the head coach up at um, uh, Okemos, and Rich Kimball, when we said to Pat Witt, well, why wouldn't you have a JV program? Why wouldn't you have a youth program as a feeder program? And he said, I don't have the coaches. Yeah. I don't have the gear. Yeah. You know, you've got Rich and, and Mike going, we can get him gear. We've got leftover gear. We can go, like Van Antwerp said, I will grab the Hazlitt coach. I will grab Kimball. We will drive up there. We will do a clinic for those parents. And I'm going, we have CDP trainers in the area too. Like, you know, we just have to do a better job, I think, of, of having these conversations. Just to let people know that there's other resources out there. Um, one of the first ones we did, Jen Dunbar said she really wanted to know what Mike Emery was doing with some of his stuff over in Rockford. Mm -hmm. And Mike turned around and said, oh, really? Because she was the one that came out and mentored me and helped me get this program up and running. Wow. So there's been all these synergies where people have said, you know, positives or people they want to interact with. And, and um, I was a bit of a, I was a bit too harsh on Hannah Nielsen the other night for not having enough Michigan players on our roster. Uh, and she flat out said, yeah, there's a kid at Northwestern, another kid at North Carolina for Michigan I'd really like to have on my roster. Like, I'm trying. So it, it's been fun to have these, but it's, it's definitely, I think, been good to open just eyes and doors because I don't know many people on the west side of the state. I know Luke Grimsman. You know, I, I know the, 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 the uh, and IAA coaches that I ref – but that's about it. And now with this, we've, we've opened up doors and friendships and everything else. So um, we're recruiting. We're recruiting hard for this, and, and we're really trying to, to grow some stuff. Um, Chris, John, any questions? Uh, I'm waiting for Chris Colin's food questions. <laughs> no food. <laughs> no food today? Uh, I, I'm very interested in the Sankofa program. You know, Chaz is a good friend of mine. Can you speak more about that and kind of how it got started, what it is, and what's the potential of bringing something like that to the city, and how can I help? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I don't know all the history. I, I should text Chaz right now and ask him, like, here, give me a quick rundown or just put him up to the camera. Um, you know, but it was definitely a vision of his to uh, be able to uh, teach the game and then, you know, bring – uh, you know, experienced players who have, you know, played in players of color to help share the game uh, within emerging communities, urban settings, uh, cities, and where kids aren't playing it at all. It's not a sport that's on anyone's radar. And so I got involved with it. Oh, I feel like my, it's a time warp, so I have no idea what timing is right now. I would say 2017. Um, I started, I think, with San Kofa, um, right after LaxCon 2017. And um, it's a great opportunity. Uh, we have communities who have emerging lacrosse programs, or it could be just a rec pro center that wants to try out lacrosse. Um, it could be an emerging team. It's really, you know, anyone who has interest in the sport, they apply to have a Sankofa clinic. And we have clinicians from around the country uh, come in and help teach the kids uh, you know, how, what the game is, how to play, and just have fun um, using the LADM model, of just, you know, small side of play, lots of games, keeping them moving, keeping them energized. Um, they're only about two hours long. Of course, you know, they, you can only get so much information in two hours, but it's really just to touch on the game, but also have the kids see players of color that they may not normally see uh, playing the sport and they have opportunity to engage with us. Um, you know, we have a lot of fun. The kids are hilarious. Um, you know, it's definitely energizing, but I say the other benefit is for all of us as clinicians to always come together. Um, it, I would say as a player of color, it's sometimes it's lonely in the game, um, you, especially you don't see many others, and having the opportunity to meet other players and have that shared experience uh, with a group of, you know, great individuals from all over is, I would say, the, you know, even a, it's just an equal of a reward as working with the kids, too. Wow, that's great. I, I, I'm not familiar with the term, though. Where, do, where does Sankofa an acronym? Is it a, a 
the traditional Native American word? I, I don't know the, the term. It's an African word. Oh, let me look it up real quick. Sorry, let me pull up my phone. Um, I do not want to mess this up, and I should have been prepared for this question because it's used. Um, think of the meaning. It is um, from Ghana, and it means translates to "go back and get it." So it's nice. I'm passing it forward. Nice. Yeah, I to, to your 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 comment on the lonely thing. That's something I'm very aware of. Uh, coaching in Detroit, we always make an attempt to try to recruit as many players of color as, as possible. We have, a, you know, we have a lot of uh, Mexican descent players. Um, I'm actually bringing an African American player from Las Vegas, and you know, for a kid being from Las Vegas, away from this family, and being a minority on a team, you know, that can be such a difficult thing. So I always make sure, and he, you know, I, he's, Chaz is a good friend of his that's uh, with Allie. And uh, so uh, there's just so many great role models out there. Kyle Harrison's always reached out to him. And, and you know, I, I love the stuff that Nations United does too. I sit on that board. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, it, it can be a lonely thing. And I love when um, you can see a greater community get together and guys from, that are all lonely in all their little places in, in the side of the world when and they get together. There's just there's just such joy. So love to see that something happen in Detroit for kind of a centralized location between for all the Midwest cities. But who knows? One we'll day get we'll get there. One I mean, day. Not, I mean, Chris. I mean, not to change up your subject and uh, you know your questions that you have answered, but just kind of roll with that. Um, who was I talking to? It was at Las Vegas convention two years ago. Yes. And oh, and I forgot the gentleman's name. I'm like just at a loss. But he um, runs the Native American team in Ontario. And I was like, it would be amazing if we have international lacrosse, like, you know, tournament. Because, and I've always wanted Detroit to be this hub of like international, you know, metropolis, which we are, but we never play up our Canadian border. And I'm like, we have such opportunity. And now with lacrosse, I think it's like a huge opportunity to really play up this international border, you know, since lacrosse is technically, you know, Canada's national sport, you know, yeah. there's great opportunities for us to really have this, you know, you know, duel at the river play, um, you could say, uh, and really put lacrosse on the map for Michigan. Yeah, we, we used to um, uh, we used to run a brother rice uh, Nally. It was a North American lacrosse invitational, and so uh, Hill Academy would come over represent Canada, and then we bring teams from you know Ohio, and and we had teams coming from Buffalo, and so it was it was a really cool weekend. Um, and then Hill got banned from playing in the state of Michigan, and then Culver got banned from the state of Michigan, and and so it really went away. We tried to keep it up. Uh, with St. Mike's, but it, it just really lost its its zest when he lost right. two of the best teams in the country. Let's make sure we're explaining that. They weren't banned from playing in the state of Michigan. There's not, like, warrants out for their arrest. <laughs> but the MHSAA said that uh, banned. MHSAA teams could not play against Hill because of the grade 13 rule or whatever it was or the PG rule. So they're welcome here. They played games that they – you broadcast oh, the game when uh, Hill played Culver. They're allowed yeah, inside yeah, they're, they're not. They're not. They're not banned from the state. I'm sorry. They're banned from playing Michigan high school teams to be specific. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so to your – one, I'm going to follow up on Christine's point. Uh, if you get in touch with me, I'll get you in touch. I'm on a, uh, on a board. Um, it's either going to be virtual this year or it's going to get pushed back to next year at the University of Michigan. Um, we're having all the youth of, um, uh, from every tribal community come in uh, to Ann Arbor and do a traditional lacrosse game, uh, educational situation. If you get in touch with me there, uh, get in touch with me after this, I'll get in touch with Ethram and maybe you can – year one's going to be just Native American and then it could grow from that. So okay. remind, just get in touch with me after. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Would love to. Yeah, so there's people working on that. Can yeah. I, I, I'd, I'd like to know from a, from a U.S. lacrosse perspective, what chapters have traditionally been, you know, strong in terms of, in terms of what we're trying to create here, uh, Chris Drew, and in terms of, you know, growing it out and building it membership wise, is, is there another chapter or chapters that, that you emulate or is it all everyone just kind of does their own thing? I mean, I think that's a good question. Um, and I, I, forgive me, I don't have like, you know, I haven't studied each individual chapter um, just to see what best practices are. Um, I just kind of look at programs. 
Uh, but I would say, but going to this now, this direct service model is changing up some things. And some chapters have already kind of been away from, um, you know, allocating money from U.S. across and being that middleman. Um, and then some, you know, have kind of probably not been nice with the money. <laughs> so hence the reason why we're in this yeah. direct service model. Um, but I think, I mean, the East Coast teams are always, you know, East Coast chapters, they're like split up in so many different ways. Um, right. you know, a lot of them run more like clubs as a chapter versus, you know, chapter chapters. I mean, there's so many different variations. So I apologize. I can't answer that question, you know. With oh, no, I, behind it, yeah, but. yeah, I mean, I think it, it just goes to the point of it's, you know, I mean, everybody is almost in a certain degree on their own to, to build it how they want to. And that's why I think with, you know, with Chris's uh, position now in, in terms of, you know, some, some, some fresh perspective, you know, I think the goal of this is really that just to, you know, to see what we can do and, and, and cultivate ideas and, and be creative uh, on how we help grow the game and, and really grow it for U.S. Lacrosse Michigan chapter. So let me chime in there, John. Um, when, when we were having the transition and, and Chip had reached the end of his term limit for president, um, we were kind of given the ultimatum of, do we want to shutter our chapter, turn back all of our funds to USL for the direct service model, or do we want to quick go ahead and donate it to all the programs in the area and shutter the chapter, give back our charter, whatever the term was? Um, and because they had not really heard from us what we wanted to do. They actually pulled our chapter link off the website. They were starting to work on, you know, dissolving the Michigan chapter. Um, so I hopped on a call with Bryce Woodson, uh, who's our Great Lakes Midwest rep, as well as Lou Corsetti. We had Gordon Corsetti on. This is his dad, Lou, who's in charge of um, not only the Southeast, but he's also the interim South Texas area rep until they replace that role. Um, so I got on there and I, I just kind of said, guys, you know, rip the bandaid off. Tell me what I need to hear. Um, and it was a great call. We talked for about an hour. And at the end of it, that was my exact question in the exact words that I used, Christiane, was I said to those guys, who can I talk to and call and say, what are your best practices? What are the pitfalls I need to avoid stepping in? How do we make sure that we're strong? How do we make sure that we're transparent? How do we make sure that we're, we're present? Um, and I'm not picking on those guys because they both said, we don't know which chapters are going to be left in the next couple of months. We'll get back to you, which reminds me, I, I email back and forth with Bryce a couple times a week on all kinds of topics. Uh, I might need to kick him in the butt and remind him that he was supposed to get back to me with, uh, you know, even if we did a Zoom call like this and had somebody from the West Coast and the South and the East Coast and say, what are you guys up against? What are you thinking? Um, yeah, John, you and I are thinking the same way on that. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, you've got the opportunity to, to, to really build it from scratch. It just, it just seems that, um, you know, now's the time to do it, and it really has been. I mean, that's why we're taking the opportunity to, to, to start to do this, um, you know, a couple times a week. And so what, you know, what, whatever your vision is, uh, Chris, and, and, and just going from there and, and building it out. Well, I, I've never been the president of a nonprofit with 7,500 constituents. Um, but I will tell you this, when I ran um, the advancement marketing for Brother Rice High School, the first couple weeks in the job, I called Western Reserve, I called Culver, I called Nobles and Greeno, I called Exeter Academy, I, I called the advancement directors, just cold called them and said, or sent them an email and said, hi, my name's Chris, I'm doing a similar role, similar role. I'm coming from the corporate world. I've never worked a nonprofit. What can you tell me? And it was like the most open, welcoming community that was like, thank you. How can we help? We'd love to mentor. We, we didn't get into nonprofit to be grumpy and greedy. We want to all help each other. So I, I, a lot of what I'm doing within the committee structure that we're trying to build here comes back to the, what I learned you know, working with those people and, and, and the, the advice that they gave me years ago. Now, I wish this was a paid position. I, I spend a lot more time on it than I should, but um, it's not. But I love the day, darn game, and I'm going to keep, you know, pushing it and, and try to keep grabbing some people and, and recruiting. So, um, yeah, as far as recruiting, uh, it seems to be a topic that we've talked about on every single one of these shows. We have nothing to talk to you about recruiting with, Christiane. No, not yet. Not yet. Ask me next year when we have our season. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we had Marianne like Meltzer on, and she was mentioning that she's already recruited a kid out of Cass Tech to come play at LTU. So I can't remember which one. Uh, Tish, I think. That sounds right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's already making an impact. Chris, I'm sorry, you were going to say something? 
yeah, so with, with that said, Christiane, you kind of had no model for what you've done in Detroit. Can you kind of, I mean, a lot of people have talked, a lot of people have said they wanted to do all the stuff that you have done. Can you kind of start where how you started and kind of give us the, uh, you know, the, the highlights of, of, and maybe some uh, roadblocks that you ran into because Detroit's a hard city to work in. Yeah. And, and a hard city to work with, and you have kind of accomplished it, which is gigantic. Right. So can you kind of tell us how that went, because I think we can all learn something from your story. Um, so uh, I, I come from more of a community development, community engagement background. Um, I mean, I have a lot of backgrounds. What am I talking about? Um, chambers and this. But, you know, a lot of it just requires me being in the community, talking with folks, you know, whether it's tabling at events and just, you know, engaging with my fellow residents. Um, so I think first and foremost, it, you know, being a resident has, you know, definitely made it, um, you know, opened up that door initially. Um, but I second, I think it was just because of the roles I've been in from a professional standpoint, I've been able to start relationships um, with individuals that can help open additional doors. And, you know, one of those was definitely having a relationship with Detroit Pal and, you know, knowing Dan Varner um, at the time who was overthink Detroit Pal during that time. Now he's the CEO at Goodwill. And you know, just saying, hey, I want to try lacrosse out, you know, I want to bring the sport. Pal seems like the natural fit, um, you know, just as a great partnership. How can we make this work? And they're like, yeah, let's, you know, work together on it. So it was not that I was forcing them to have a team or like start a program. It was, I was more like, let's mutually come together. And I think that's really where a lot of the success has been is just because it's like, hey, I have the, you know, I have this knowledge of the game, you know, I can get equipment, I can, you know, start to figure out how to re recruit coaches and, you know, people who are, are former lacrosse players in the closet somewhere in a, you know, locked in a cubicle. Um, I just need the kids. And that's really kind of been the angle I've uh, approached in many of the things I've done is so whether it's pals, like, hey, or I need the kids, also can maybe have a field space um, to then uh, just establishing myself as like, here, I want to do lacrosse in Detroit. Let's work with kids to get them playing. So how was, you know, opening uh, that first step, doing two week-long camps with them in 2009. Uh, I want to say 2009, 2009 and 10. And that's then when the John Wright, John yeah, Wright got, that, got me, I, I worked that camp. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> See, I know. I'm like, I'm like, you look so familiar, but. I was there too. <laughs> yeah. Don, Don Gay and I had the best station on earth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I was paired up with Mike Johannes, the uh, the old Detroit lacrosse uh, goalie, or you know, Deal Sal goalie, Butler goalie. So if you were with Dwayne, I was with Johan somewhere out there. With Don Gay, it was amazing. <laughs> it was all a blur. Like literally, like putting together a camp. I was just like, let's organize. I can't. I mean, I have to pull up my old coaches roster. I still have all those. So I probably find your names like when I look back at it. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, and then that just kind of really started. And then, um, you know, just finding different opportunities to partner with different programs that are happening in the city. So it was not saying, here, have a team, because that was never the focus, at least my angle. I was never just trying to start a team and get kids playing competitively. It was like, no, let's have kids just start to fall in love with the game, have fun, um, get introduced to it, um, and then just slowly, incrementally build it organically. Also, you know, I felt it, it was more by myself initially, so there was only so much time to – you know, be out there uh, uh, helping to coach. But, you know, whether we did day camps with, uh, you know, the rec department uh, and then just starting to form the relationships with them there, you know, it just started to, you know, slowly just open more and more doors if individuals were willing to help. So, you know, getting through fields, you know, complimentary field space in partnership with the rec department, working with PAL to get additional kids, um, and then just forming relationships with other nonprofits. So, like, um, you know, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, you know, we're starting one with um, Boys and Girls Club of Southeast Michigan. So really just building, you know, the relationships formed in the professional world and just bringing them to the lacrosse world has kind of been my angle the whole time. And it's been slow. I mean, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Clearly, it's been, you know, 10 years later from whenever all this has started. Um, and it's still not at, you know, in a, a huge organized fashion. We don't have this whole inner city league play that I envision. The goal was to start that this summer. However, given the current pandemic we're in, that's not going to happen again this year. So, um, you know, we'll try it again next year. But just, you know, working with great, uh, you know, partners in the community has been key. Who's been some of your good partners? Because, I mean, you know, I'm in my head right now. I'm going through from 2009 to 2019. I mean, 
you've been taking a lot of swings. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think people, most people around the state of Michigan realize how hard you've had to work to get to the point where Cast Tech had a team. Um, it, it's just, you know, it's amazing because I've just, you know, I've being close but not, you know, close but not involved. Uh, you hear about all the, the swing and miss, the swing and home run, the swing and a, a you know, a base hit. Uh, you've taken a lot of that bat, so you, you're a pretty tough lady. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. Uh, it's like, it, yeah, it's uh, a lot of people have tried, a lot of people have failed, and, and you've stuck with it. So um, these kids are very lucky to have you uh, doing all this. Oh, thanks. Um, who's, been, who's been the best partner for you uh, besides Pal? Um, I mean, I would say definitely U.S. lacrosse. I mean, I definitely could not have done it without U.S. lacrosse. Um, you know, all this is possible through, you know, first stick grants and, you know, the diversity inclusion grants. Um, you know, that's really helped because having that uh, just initial infusion of equipment and resources has been able just to be like, here, I have all the equipment in the back of my car. Let's go out and play versus, you know, scrambling around the city, asking for additional, you know, equipment donations. Um, you know, it's just giving kids new things to play with and they're able to go out there and, um, you know, play. Another good partner is, um, I would say not, I would actually tote my mother-in-law and, and actually my husband, their nonprofit. So they run Midnight Golf. Okay. And that's a great yeah. model, um, for us to follow in terms of engaging kids, learning how to grow, you know, seeing where the best practices are. Granted, they have, um, you know, it's golf. And they use more of that as a hook to get kids to, you know, engage in their program, which is more about life skills. But just, right. you know, seeing that and having, you know, those relationships that they have as well. And that support um, has been great and key to just to help, you know, keep it going. And also having another, you know, resource in terms of getting kids who want to play that may not have gotten into their program or who are interested in that program and another uh, avenue. Um, Metro YMCA has been great. So, we have. I mean, I would say the list goes on and on. Um, it's just, just, but Pal, our um, Parks and Recreation Department, um, Midnight Golf, YMCA, who else did I reach out to? Yeah, those are kind of like our, my, I would say top, in my top five. That's outstanding. Has, has most of this support come from community grants and community organizations, or, or have you been able to get any corporate sponsorships? That's been my, that was, the corporate sponsorship was what I was starting to work on this year, um, especially leading into our summer program. So the summer was actually a partnership with uh, Detroit United, PAL, and um, uh, Parks and Recreation Department. So that was going to be our first go at almost having an inner city league um, recreation uh, program. And, you know, reach out to our corporate partners, you know, not only for donations, but also for coaches. You know, you know, everyone who's, you know, in Quicken or in the family of companies over there, like, hey, I know there's some lacrosse players hidden over there. And I have some friends who run their volunteer programs and a lot of their community outreach programs. And that was going to be our next Seven. place. Seven. Right. See? Yeah. <laughs> so that was going to be our next place to tap into. And now um, JJ Velez, who came from Parks and Recreation as their uh, uh, deputy director, he's now over the um, public space and outdoor programming for Quicken. Um, and so that was like a natural tie in to help, you know, get that play. We're trying to get ready to actually play downtown in this new field that they were going to build. So there's, a, you know, a lot of opportunities that were on the horizon. It was just, you know, we're kind of at a standstill right now. Yeah. You know, so when we had Summer on the first time, uh, she had made mention that just really trying to get sticks and get equipment and gear down there. Uh, and so Losi and I were talking about, um, you know, can we do a gear drive in our communities, whether it's, you know, I've got a bucket of sticks in the garage. I, I have, if I don't have 40 sticks out there, it's at least 35. Um, <laughs> and not all of these are sentimental values collector's items. Some of these are just when you coached as long as we have, your car becomes the lost and found after every practice and game. And if the kids say, you know, you hold up the stick 10 times, you go, whose is this? And nobody says mine. It goes yeah. in the bucket in the garage. So uh, we can definitely probably start, you know, doing some some grassroots stuff. I'm even wondering if if all of our buddies that own stores, like, you know, Chris Marucci up at, at uh, Michigan Lacrosse Company, Sean Higgins and Stinson Meller, Ken Brubaker out at 313, um, you know, if we could always have like a, um, you know, like the Toys for Tots box kind of thing that you see at a church where it's like, hey, we're collecting used, gently used gear. Do we, we want to rehab it and, and get it out in the community. I don't think those guys would have any objection of that. Yeah, that'd be great. 
Yeah, I, I think there was one, uh, like maybe two or three years ago, I thought there was a, I remember seeing a lacrosse drive at, at Palmer Park. Um, I can't remember exactly who, I don't know, I can't remember who was running it, but I know it was all about youth lacrosse and, um, you know, I mean, really just doing something like that again and just generating the interest to, to get rid of the stuff. I mean, I've got a bucket outside with sticks in it and it grows slowly but surely since I put it out there after the summer interview, people are coming by and taking them. So <laughs> one at a time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we were even kicking the tires on if we could get um, Higgins to put together a stringing cl clinic. So find a couple of kids from your programs and, and okay, who wants to be the stick doctor? Who, who yeah. wants to be, you know, the, the, the guy or the girl that, that knows how to do all this stuff? Yeah. Um, we can get some, some, you know, quality used gear and some, some stringing kits donated and teach a couple of kids. Um, I think it would be a lot of fun to, to, to go in and sit through that with them and, and learn myself because I still am horrible at stringing Dang. sticks. The funny thing you said that because I was like, I went to, at a convention this year, they had a, a, string, a couple stringing sessions and I was like geeking out on it. I'm like, really? Like, like a whole new world's like continually open up in my eyes of, you know, the power of the stringing of a stick. And so I think it'd be a great opportunity for our kids to, you know, go have spend that. an hour with Sean Higgins and you'll <laughs> you'll be break out <laughs> right sean's knowledge of of looking at the kids mechanics and figuring out whether the stick needs to be fixed or the mechanics need to be fixed or or looking at your game and stringing a stick in a pocket custom to the way that you play is ridiculous awesome. um, and, and i know that he can't put it out there because of ncaa violations or whatever but you think about the top players from Michigan on the men's and women's side that we've followed over the years, he's strung all of their sticks. Wow. They send him, you know, heads, he strings them and sends them back. And um, he's, he's stitched. He's the wizard when it comes to that stuff. I know uh, Sergio was in there today for Sergio gets four every, every month. Sean has to do four of them for him. Wow. Four heads, and he, you know, he uses them for I think a week and a half, week and a half, week and a half, week and a half, and uh, yeah, that's the kind of level that he's at right wow. now with uh, his stringing. Well, yeah, I mean, Sergio is, is is then giving those heads away on his Instagram or his social media. You know, tags somebody and he'll give the heads away because as he's you know now worn them down with however thousand shots he takes a week. That's crazy. Pay it forward. It's like sneakers. <laughs> yeah. well, like um one other intro i wanted to ask christian if, if i could make um it used to be the the boys and girls clubs of oakland and macomb county i think and now it's the metro detroit youth clubs okay. um the the executive director's son plays for me up here in clarkston um, and I know he's always looking for activities, resources, stuff. He only has one club in Detroit proper, um, and it's the Levin Commer Club uh, inside Durfee Innovation Society. Yeah. Um, but his other clubs are Ferndale, Royal Oak, Southfield, and then he's got one up in Washington Township. Um, but he's always looking to just get kids involved and active and stuff. So I might email Brett and copy you on it just to make an intro to see if there's any value there. That'd be great. Absolutely. I love intros. And I've been calling it the Detroit PAL for years, and you guys keep calling it the PAL. So at least I learned something today that I've been pronouncing <laughs> oh, yeah. it. Detroit PAL. Yeah. So um, as we kind of are, are looking at not having a 2020 season, um, are, are you and your kids looking at doing any activities over summer? Are you trying to, to come up with a way to, to get the Cast Tech girls a game before the seniors all move on? What are you trying to do? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a matter of, like, when things can open up. Um, summer is, you know, been definitely talking to other coaches around the state and definitely in the area. Um, I think it's as, as soon as we're able to not be as socially distanced, <laughs> um, you know, and at least be able to play, uh, you know, we want to get them out there as soon as possible. Um, and I think, it, you know, with our summer, uh, I mean, the summer season itself, uh, that's the same thing we're looking at um, right now. The Parks and Rec has actually canceled all their summer activities for the entire summer, so that was a little disappointing. Mm. But, you know, completely understandable um, just to, you know, make sure that nothing um, uh, the, doesn't raise up again. But, you know, I think there's still opportunities for how can we get kids playing. But, you know, safety is definitely the first concern. And then as soon as 
know, we're able to do it in a safe conditions based on, I would say, our, you know, our city government and our partners, which is key. Like we can't go against, you know, what our partners are looking to do and, yeah. and across that. Um, we'll get them playing as soon as possible. And if not, we'll wait till the winter, um, you know, try to do some winter programming that we've um, been wanting to do for a while, taking more of an angle from that midnight golf model um, in the winter time. Um, you know, we're excited to still, we'll still have at least various opportunities from fall ball and our three, uh, and our uh, like short, uh, was it three on three play? Do we have three on three or five on five? I can't remember. It all makes us together. Uh, um, you know, from our fall season to our winter season, you know, we hope to give them at least a few more opportunities to play. Unfortunately, our seniors, you know, we can only do so much, yeah. um, you know, with the time allotted, but, you know, we definitely want to make sure that other kids still have some opportunities too. You know, I, I went back and was watching some of our earlier episodes, just kind of reminding myself of some of the topics that we covered. Um, and, and, you know, what we were talking about back early March when we started doing this stuff, or mid-March, um, you know, we still hadn't had school canceled. We still were trying to figure right. out, okay, if we can have a state championship on June 9th, how many games a week is too many games? And, right. and it's been... It's been therapeutic, I think, a little bit. I think Losi and I have been able to blow off a little bit of steam about, you know, our, our concerns with what's next and what's going on. Um, but, yeah, you know, we, we just – I was talking with Brian Kaminskis the other day. Um, you know, he's trying to figure out if he does have tournaments this summer, does right. he have to tell the coaches, no tent city. Tent yeah. cities are banned because you're going to have too many people that are, are in an enclosed, you know, small space. Or, you know, are, are there going to be ways that we have to tell parents – um, or the coaches, sorry, you are allowed 15 parents per team, no siblings, no grandparents. Like, you know, how do we, if, if, if we're still doing social distancing and all that stuff, how do we do it? And I, being the smart aleck that I am, have said several times, how do I blow a whistle through an N95 mask? Um, but we'll figure it out. I mean, if they give us the green light, I, I know that there's enough John Losey's and Brian Kaminskis's and, and everybody else that are trying to find a, a way to get the kids – some touches, some fun, some recruitment opportunities, some 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 one last senior day, and everything else. I've I've built. Uh, I think I'm on my third schedule now since the actual season was canceled. So um, I'm hoping that one of these will actually stick. So um, we'll see. I mean, I've got I've got a game set right now. If you know, starting in June. I mean, the MHSA is, has been very flexible and accommodating for the revisions of, of, of allowing 15 games to be played from June 1st to uh, August 1st. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's really about the social gathering piece of it with the state of Michigan and saying, you know, you, you can do it. Um, you know, and what I put together, you know, th there's no fans. Right? I've, I'm only allowing kids in there and I've got temperature checks and technology and all kinds of stuff that I'm putting out there that is going to be a part of it somehow, some way, I think. Um, but you know, until we get the green light, as you said, we just sit here and wait more, more waiting. I'm tired of waiting. Yeah. Can you talk dreams while we're waiting. Can, can you, Christian, can you talk about uh, this inner city uh, league that you want to do, whether you want to talk about from the, from your envision to the cast tech today or work from cast tech all the way to your envision? Can you kind of give us an idea of what you want to build? Yeah, um, I would say it's like two, uh, they're like together, but separate. They're mutually, they're exclusive a little bit. Um, so the, I would say the summer program, speaking towards that, um, it was just starting off with getting, um, using our rec centers as hubs, because we know, you know, having opportunity for kids to have fields, but also an indoor space in case of weather or, you know, bathrooms, you know, all those necessities that is when we're working with kids and also a place to store equipment. And so we're going to identify, we start identify um, a couple rec centers, um, at least three, um, a west side location, an east side location, and then having kind of like a central or southwest location. And that was going to be our first three. And then those kids will play each other on Saturdays. So taking a book out of uh, Brooklyn Lacrosse Club's model, um, you know, they practice during the week and then on the weekend they would have a play day, scrimmage day, and we we're going to look to do the same thing um, for the summer for eight weeks to start off with. It was going to start July, um, week of July 6th and run through right up until Labor Day. And so we're in right before kids went back to school. And I mean, fingers crossed, maybe we might be able to do something. Who knows? Um, of course, we have to reevaluate, you know, how do we go about the model? If the rec centers are closed, are we going to break their policies and procedures from a city standpoint? 
Um, but that was what we're looking at doing. And then, you know, as it picked up, we would continue to grow that model. Um, ages, it was going to be a wide age range and we were going to cast a wide net because, you know, we didn't want to exclude any kids who have interests that were in the age range. So it was going to be basically like seven to 17, um, you can say, just to, you know, get as many kids playing and then even having opportunity on some of the Saturdays um, to have more like peewee play. Um, and like six and under uh, to play and you know just a short time period and just giving an opportunity if they're there to watch their siblings play um, you know they can pick up a stick and we can just do some small fun coaching with them too uh, and so that was going to start off with this year and then our goal was to continue to add on a new rec center and a new you know corner of the city you know ideally it would be great to have you know, almost every district in the city have its own team um, that would be seven total if not more um, or at least definitely having West Side, East Side, Southwest, Central, and then maybe, you know, and then adding in additional regions as um, more and more interest arose. So that was around, our, you know, our focus this year. Uh, with CAS, the same thing. It's more just starting to grow because um, uh, the play within the city, because if there's kids at high schools like Renaissance and King, if they don't have a lacrosse team, where are they going to play and who are they going to play with? Um, initially, I was thinking just having a, you know, my, you know, this was before CAS came around. Um, I want to just have like, well, speaking of Detroit United team, minus the nonprofit program, but actually having a Detroit United club, you know, high school team that could play um, because it's emerging sport, it fits in with the MSHA, you know, regulation, you know, rules that uh, even though the schools are huge, because it's a new sport, um, emerging sport that we could have one unified club team for the city. And so that was gonna be, you know, my initial thought, but CAS came around, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, we still have to think about how do we get other high, uh, schools playing as well too, and bringing them into the fold. So that's still ongoing. I mean, I would love to have CAS, King, Renaissance kind of be the top three teams, you know, from a high school standpoint. And, um, and I think those are the three strongest to actually carry a team at this point. Um, and then if there's more teams wanna play, we have to just figure out how we can um, continue to incorporate and grow the sport to other schools as well too, whether it's um, DPSCD, if it's, you know, charter schools. I mean, it gets a little bit more and more complicated the more this sport grows, especially right. within the city. Um, but I think, you know, as many ways that we can get them playing um, and the interest continues to grow, I think it's a good problem to have. What's, 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 been, the, what's been the biggest, um, you know, pushback, maybe from parents or, you know, just exposing as many people as you can to the game on, on maybe why they don't want their kids to play lacrosse or has there I been mean, anything in particular that stands out? It's pretty much, I mean, it's been a, a, a very, not, I mean, I love PAL, but it's like a very strong PAL football culture, you know, and then the, the boys play football, the girls cheerlead, you know, and then trying to. Tradition. Yeah. And then it, the, in those seasons, if it, from a summertime starts to overlap, because that's right now all of our lacrosse re human resources, as you all know, because you're all involved is, you know, we're all tied up in the springtime. So trying to do anything in the true season yeah. um, until it really takes off is really hard. So it's very, um, it, it's more um, approachable to do it as a, you know, summer recreational type of sport or off season or off lacrosse season engagement. And so, but once that happens, we're starting to run into all the other sports that kids have been ingrained in. So whether it's soccer, whether it's baseball, whether it's you know, football, and this is from the boy side, girl right. side, you know, they're still, uh, you know, there's volleyball, there's basketball, there's all these sports that they just grew up playing, all their friends play. And so it's really trying to kind of break that um, social norm that they've been used to. And that mm -hmm. lacrosse is something you can play just because your friends don't play doesn't mean that, you know, you won't be good at it. Um, or, you know, you won't be cool because you're not playing football, but actually you can play all these sports because as lacrosse players, we in coaches and the game organizers, we encourage you to be a multi-sport athlete, to be even a better athlete than ever sport that you do play. Um, so it's definitely that um, education, but those football coaches out there are very intense. <laughs> they don't want their players to play anything but football. Um, and it's just little track in the spring right yeah and some track too yeah and so it's just you know those the coaches are very strong-willed I would say you know anywhere but as you all know probably in you know your own city communities and schools like you know coaches are very strong in terms of you playing my sport and my sport only and you're going to be the greatest athlete in my sport only and um trying to break that mentality of trying something new is I would say the biggest challenge that we've had not necessarily the parents, but the parents also see that, you know, they're very just used to these traditional sports, yeah. um, these 
industry in sports and trying to break that in their heads too that you know your kid actually probably succeed and get further playing lacrosse than they would in the other right. school i think it's starting to catch on a little bit more and more as they see it um but it's just going to take more visibility and because it's not played in the schools like it is in some other schools and um, you know we just have to get it um in front of the kids as many times as possible yeah Change is hard. I mean, that you know, it's ingrained, as you said. I mean, that, that really is the key term, I think, in what you're trying to accomplish. It's just, it, it's ingrained. And, you know, parents that have had, you know, older siblings go through it. And so it's brothers and sisters. And they, you know, everyone's just kind of following the same path because, yeah. you know, as we all know, we, you know, consistency is consistency. And so that, that, that it gives you a warm feeling to, to do the same thing. And it's tradition and it makes it hard to kind of buck the norm. But you know, I, I think it's just that visibility, as you mentioned, getting out there and, and doing things like that. I mean, I, you know, we were talking to Summer. I'm like, I, I'd love to come down and do a, you know, a live stream broadcast of, of some games, uh, you know, a game, uh, something like that. Or just, you know, just the more visibility and the more stuff that we can do, I think is just going to help. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. You know, I, I think I've told the story on an earlier episode, but my I took my son and his Cub Scout, uh, our, our den, to Debare, the, the big scout ranch out in um, Lapeer, Metamora. And uh, I threw 10 lacrosse sticks and a couple dozen balls in the back of my truck just because I knew there was going to be downtime in between stuff. And I figured, we'll, we'll let these kids try it out if they haven't tried it before. And the number of dads that came over and picked up a stick that went, man, I wish they had this when I was a kid. You know, I wasn't big enough for football, and I wasn't tall enough for basketball, and I wasn't fast enough for track, but I could have done this. You know, I hear that over and over, and, and I'm wondering with, um, you know, as, as we were saying, some of the most premier athletes that we have in the game are, you know, people of color, where it's, you know, you've got Chaz, you've got uh, Christmas, you've got Kyle Harrison, you've got, um, who's the big guy from the chaos? Um, that played at Duke, I'm blanking on his name. Um, you know, there are role models in this sport, and, and there are role models because these guys aren't bench warmers. They're playing at the highest level, and they're the premier athletes. Do you start seeing some of these kids, you think, saying, I want to be Chaz Woodson when I grow up instead of I want to be – pick whatever other marquee athlete out there. Um, do you think that, that the worm will start turning soon? Um, I, I mean, I hope so. I think it just requires just more visibility and more kids playing. Um, and also – now that Premier League, you know, lacrosse exists, it's getting more and more visible. ESPN is playing a lot more games than they ever have ever played. And, you know, all the other sports channels are picking up more and more lacrosse games um, than I've ever seen uh, and before. So I used to, like, when a women's game was on, I would record it because I knew it would be, like, the only game I would see for the right. whole year. Um, now, like, it's happening all the time. And I think that's helping to add visibility and just getting so people know who, you know, individuals are in the sport. But I think also it is for us as chapters and U.S. lacrosse too, to help showcase the great players that are in the game. Um, you know, we always, I mean, it, I feel like it tires out, but everyone says it and it's like, what's the greatest lacrosse player that ever played? And it's like Jim Brown. And people are like, Oh, whoa, Jim Brown. Yeah. Um, and, but, and then the part of me is like, Oh my gosh, how many more times do I have to use that? But that's the only way that people start to right. really understand you know, really, you know, some of the greatest players that exist as well as, you know, they are multi-sport athletes too. And so using that to combat, you know, those crazy football coaches. Who, I was going to say, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, we, you know, we need to put more. I've got a picture actually in my office, um, of uh, an autographed picture of Jim Brown in his lacrosse outfit. My, my dad gave it to me. And so nice. uh, it's very, it's always a topic of conversation with people coming to my office. They go, wait, is it Jim Brown played lacrosse? And I'm like, right. yep, he did. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I was going to mention like the the old DVR game when it was going to be on ESPNU or the CBS College Sports Channel. You know, back in the day, you would record every single one, and now it's the exact opposite. I'm so busy during the season coaching my kids, plus ref in high school, plus ref in college, that I have to like find which one game of the week that I either not hear the score yet. So I can watch it as a fan or which one is everyone on Twitter talking about so I can find the time to watch that one. That's another reason why I love the PLL this summer because I was camping with my family and, you know, there, there was a night game on a Saturday night. Kids are around the campfire, cocktails with my in-laws, and I got my phone out and I'm watching PLL games. It was great. Right. So, yeah, the, the more that we get the John Losey's of the world broadcasting for us, the, the, the better off we all are. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in any game, anytime. I'm in. <laughs> so go. I'm ready for my most important question. Go Food for question. it. Food? Are we ready? Food. <laughs> uh, American or Lafayette? 
Oh, it's a great question. That is, it's a great question. I mean, so I'm probably like the worst one to answer this one because I actually switched sides. <laughs> I, I just switched two years oh. ago. Yeah, so I went, I used to be a diehard Lafayette, you know, growing up, but then they switched up like their hot dog recipe and like their chili recipe, like something just did not taste like it did like back in the day. They, I remember like, it was like a, you know, article like, oh, they changed up something and then I switched over to American. Um, I, but you know. So I did the same thing two years ago. I get, a, I take a lot of people that don't know that they switched it up. Yeah. Aren't real Detroiters. And don't and they still give me crap about it. I'm like, no, no, it all changed. I'm I'm 100 American now. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm right there with you. It changed the recipe. It doesn't taste the same. <laughs> just the nostalgia. It's really I don't know what they did, but just the nostalgia of having to use the bathrooms at Lafayette when you no. feel like you're in a submarine no. climbing no. under no. bulkheads. No. no. <laughs> no. Like, that's when you hold it and don't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, like, you know, before you go. <laughs> and, bring, and bringing that up with what we're going through right now, it's like, oh, my word. <laughs> right. No. No good. Um, and I didn't know this. Uh, you were uh, one of the, I wouldn't say regulars, but my friend Owen Burke that owns the Firebird Tavern, when he used to own Pulse down on Monroe, you used to have a lot of events down there. Yes, I did. A lot of events, a lot of cocktails. <laughs> um, yeah, anytime I go to Firebird, I still make them make my old cocktail that they used to do at Pulse, so a Mustang. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yep, have some great memories. Opening day, yeah. I, I, I spent way too much money. I felt like, I'm like, how did I have so much money when I made less money? <laughs> the income was just, it was easy. When you go, what, read in your pocket, there's always money in there. There's always oh, money. Yeah. Now I'm like, what? <laughs> exactly. Well, Owen uh, is uh, the best man at my, medding, at my wedding, one of my best friends. And with that second floor there, I'm going to find a way that we're going to do a Hall of Fame dinner, um, a coach's clinic, a, a something on that second floor because it's just such a good spot. It is, definitely. Yeah, yeah if we can yeah. ever get out of quarantine, we can go out to get a beer and a burger somewhere again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I just want to be on a patio, like uh, all these nice days that we've been having, other than my own back patio looking at trees and people drive by. I, I may be escaping jail. I'm getting very close to that uh, that tipping point where I may just be jumping in the car by myself and driving south. Yeah. <laughs> I have the inflatable hot tub. I was lucky enough to get the inflatable hot tub early on in this thing nice. and it saved me. Yeah. <laughs> very I mean, nice. I usually I've, I've been making like breaks to the grocery store like me and the husband fight who's going to the grocery store. I'm like <laughs> I shouldn't be that excited to get out the house but yeah. right. Right. Some people, uh, some, people, some people are afraid you're fighting to go. I love yeah, it. Yeah, especially like eight in the morning. I'm like, I am getting up at the crack of dawn to get to the grocery store and like willingly. So, yeah. Time yeah. To so we always try to keep these to about an hour. We're about an hour. We're not wrapping it up. If we got more stuff to talk about, we'll keep going. But, you know, we, we always kind of touch on a bunch of topics, but I always ask some curious questions like, what was your favorite lacrosse memory, either as a player or a coach or even as, as an administrator with all you've done? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, I think the one memory that sticks out definitely as a player um, was my senior year game. We went to the uh, semifinals against Gross Point South, and it was like a double overtime. Like, it was raining. It was one of those, like, crazy classic games that, like, rain delays and overtimes. And it came down to, like, a last penalty shot, and we lost in a penalty shot. Mm. But it was just, like – but it was a double overtime. So, I mean, at least it was a hard-fought battle. Um, and it was, like, you know, classic coaching. Um, I remember there was two uh, – there was one time that uh, – I forgot what year my JV team it was, but – um, literally my girls were like, we need to do a rain dance to see if it rains. And literally they went into the middle of the field and like, you thought the sun was shining and, you know, kind of got cloudy. They went to the middle of the field, did like their own interpretation of a rain dance. And it literally started. Boom. The skies <laughs> so, opened up. Yeah. They were, listening. They we're listening. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was a funny one. I would say, um, Detroit lacrosse stuff. Uh, I would say it was doing that first camp in 2009. I mean, that definitely stuck out. It was, you know, we Warrior was a partner in that one, too. And I think it was just, like, the start of, like, people coming together to get a sport um, going. Uh, and there was definitely energy. And I'm, like, running a day camp for lacrosse for a week. <laughs> Who would have thought? 
Um, but it definitely worked. And, it, you know, it's definitely one of those fun memories. I mean, I think Chaz didn't come to that when he came to our 2010 one. And I was like, Chaz, I found a picture of you back when you were, you know, this premier player playing with Warrior. You came down to Detroit to do this with us. Um, He's and he was still like, oh, yeah, still premier player. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, and so, yeah, it was um, – it was good times. I mean, I think that definitely sticks out. And, you know, I'm definitely excited for memories to, you know, be had coming up um, as we get more and more kids playing again. I forgot Warrior brought their big inflatable yeah. things and we had to shuttle all the kids from the nice yeah. turf field across the street to the yeah. weeds. <laughs> but we made it work. Yeah. Um, I remember the kids crying at the end of it because they were so sad it was over. Yeah, they just kind of want to play dodgeball the whole time. And we're like, no, we want to play lacrosse. We're not playing dodgeball all the time. But yeah, I I don't remember the dodgeball. I, I think if it was a five day camp, I made it down over there for three of the days. Okay. Um, but again, that's I, I'm I'm surprised I remember this much going back ten years. <laughs> right. I can't remember ten days ago, let alone ten years. Right now, it's all one big month. It is. I don't even know what day. I don't even what what's today Thursday. I think so. Oh. It's a perfect example. Uh, I, I do a lot of networking through the Chamber of Commerce and everything, and there's a networking group I run that, that we meet the first and third Thursday of every month. And so I was planning on going, and I looked at them like, we have five Thursdays in this month. This month will not end. We are quarantined. <laughs> and we're stuck, and it won't stop. It's Groundhog's Day every day. Yeah. February had 29 days. April had 175 days. It's <laughs> weird. And we um, had every weather possible during this month, too. Oh, God. From snow to 70 degrees. To right. Fall. You know, you look outside today, and I went out and, you know, I, I got some pizza for the kids, curbside takeaway, and uh, it's rainy and drizzly and crummy. And I'm like, how is this helping in any? Like, the other day it was nice. You know, I work in this this office. I'm here. It's like an insane asylum. I might as well just pad these walls that I'm in all day long. And you go outside and you lay on the deck a little bit and get some sun. And it's like, okay, this is I can do this. And then yeah. it rains and it's cold. And it's like, okay, here we go again. Mm -hmm. Big we got a dog two weeks ago and the kids were like, oh, we're going to walk him every day. And I'm like, if we're going to get a dog, this is the time to do it. We're not all gone for lacrosse. And then it snows the rest of the next week. And then it's been raining. And the kid's like, it's cold out there. So, yeah, yeah. I'm walking the dog. Um, as far as kind of anything else you want to plug, do you want to give us people a, a Twitter handle to follow or, or, or a Facebook page for, for Cast Tech Girls or, or anything like that, that you want to put out there? Oh, good point. Um, so, like, we have Detroit United Lacrosse.org is the website. Um, like, I remember my other website, so I'm trying to, like, make sure I get all the handles right. Um, Detroit United, I know, is on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Definitely Instagram. Um, you could just search it. It'll pop up. I can't remember the exact handle because I feel – because I'm always one to shorten lacrosse, and then some people, like, lengthen it up. Um, yeah, and definitely follow us. Or, you know, it's um, – you know, reach out. We're on the website. Um, we're on all the, you know, you can reach out to me on Facebook. I'm on there. I'm on Instagram as well. So, um, yeah, LinkedIn, if you want to be professional. <laughs> um, I mean, if we have to. Right, right, if we have to. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely continuous support in, um, you know, kids playing and whether, it, you know, you want to come out and coach, you want to, you know, volunteer. If you have equipment, if you have people or corporations you know who are willing, you know, once we get past this epidemic, um, who still have money left in their, <laughs> in their charitable giving donation areas and are looking for a great um, pl place to, you know, donate, um, you know, definitely help the kids here in the city play lacrosse. We're um, definitely looking forward to it because, you know, because the season shortened and you lost across their season shortened, you know, definitely funds are not as, um, you know, flowing as easily as they used to. and to get our program going, you know, we're definitely not the most expensive sport, but we're definitely up there in terms of resources yeah. needed to make a good quality experience, which is what we're definitely, you know, wanting to do. It's just not just a, you know, half-ass experience for the kids. We want them to give them the full lacrosse experience as much as possible. And, you know, that requires resources, both human capital and, you know, actual monetary capital, as well as sticks and equipment too. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, yeah. we, and the biggest thing I think, you know, with what we're doing here, I was thinking about the other day is that, 
you know, while it's, you know, we talk about this and we spend time doing it and we're, and we're all engaged in it. And, you know, the, the concern is that when we break free from this, that this is kind of in the rear view mirror and then we get going that way again. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, that you know, I, I'm telling myself is that to remember everything that we, you know, that, that we had done on these, you know, like we're talking about with you and, and getting uh, down and, and, and supporting and, and doing, you know, I, I'm really nobody, but, um, I pretend to be somebody on social media, um, you know, just to keep that keep that going and make sure that we're consistent and we stick with everything that we talked about and not get sideways when we when we when we break free. Absolutely. All right, so everyone, go follow all of Christian's stuff, DetroitUnitedLacrosse.org. Uh, we'll tag all you in this stuff when we post it. I'm trying to we're trying to film every Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday, and then I take a couple days to edit so we post the following Thursday, Sunday, Tuesday as kind of our schedule. Okay. Um, so uh, he's at Lax Losey. He's at, well, Elizabeth Colon. Uh, he's at Chris Colon. You I've seen her a couple Chris times tonight, too. It was a nice picture. Tell, uh, tell your wife it's a good picture. Run. They're very professional. Yep. Uh, if you're not a member already, go join U.S. Lacrosse. It's at uslacrosse.org, and there's a join button. We get to do a lot of cool things. And um, we've got summer on this weekend. Hopefully that recording goes well. Uh, and we're just having fun with these. So anyone has any recommendations for people we need on? I've gotten texts from friends over the last couple of days giving me their resume saying, you know, I could be a, like, we're going to get to everybody. We're going to get to you. Uh, but we're just having fun with it. So some, um, like I said, we're going to have summer on. Christiane, thank you for all you do for the thank game. You. Thank you for your time tonight. And everyone stay safe. Thank you for being a great leader of our Michigan chapter. Appreciate Yay. it. Yay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.